is a board member of Ethics and Tech. From very early on, he's been involved with Ethics and Technology. Um, he is a, a staff writer at Common Dreams, as well as Collective 20, um, which is a activist group and that he's been contributing and writing on their behalf. Brett, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You have the stage. Thank you, Vahid. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to those of you who have attended our previous Ethics and Tech events. It's great to be back here again with these great speakers and comedians. Well, when Vahid told me that the theme of tonight's event was going to be hopes and dreams for President Biden's Mideast policy, I was quite excited. I envisioned shooting for the stars and discussing a broad dream agenda encompassing everything from ending the never-ending U.S. wars that by now have claimed at least hundreds of thousands of civilian lives in over half a dozen countries, to ending the hypocritical sanctions on Iran, to disavowing dictatorships in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and elsewhere. Now, while Biden may indeed end up doing one or more of these things, and I think he deserves some credit for pulling back some of the U.S. Uh, support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen, it's the world's worst humanitarian crisis, it would be a disservice to everyone watching to stick too literally to the hopes and dreams theme. After all, we live in reality, and the crises of our time deserve realistic solutions. And so I've decided tonight to take on a topic that's confounded generations of U.S. policymakers, Israel-Palestine and how Biden could address it. I know you're probably thinking this is one of the most daunting challenges facing any president, but as, as you'll soon see, a different approach is not only possible, it's actually been done before, even if just a little bit. First, to tee up my argument, I'm gonna read you some excerpts from a human rights report on Israel-Palestine. Bear with me, it's only gonna take a minute, and there's a method to my madness. So this report says, quote, Significant human rights issues included reports of unlawful or arbitrary killing, arbitrary detention, restrictions on non-Israelis residing in Jerusalem, including arbitrary or unlawful interference with privacy, family, and home, significant restrictions on freedom of movement, killing 132 Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, most victims who posed no immediate threat. Many were shot in their upper body and some in the back. This despite IDF claims that soldiers aimed below the knees with the intention to, not wound, to wound and not kill. On the torture of prisoners, the report details, quote, political prisoners, thousands of prisoners held in unsuitable living conditions unfit for human habitation, exceptional measures used during interrogation, including beatings, stress positions, threats of rape and physical harm, painful pressure from shackles, sleep deprivation, and threats against families. The report cites the case of Samir El Arbid, who was taken to hospital, quote, unconscious with serious injuries, including the inability to breathe, kidney failure, and broken ribs. It also notes the unethical force feeding of prisoners. As for Israel's national, racial, and ethnic minorities, including its own Arab citizens, the report notes, quote, persistent institutional and societal discrimination, and quote, Israeli leaders who incited racism against the Arab community, before noting incidents of violent attacks, including price tag attacks by settlers on Palestinian people and property. That's just part of a report that also, by the way, discusses the indictment of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for alleged bribery, fraud, and other corruption. So, you may ask, who published this report? Well, it's from 2019. Was it a hostile Arab nation? Was it the anti-Semitic United Nations or BDS movement? Or the self-hating Jews at B'Tselem or of Jewish Voice for Peace? No, it was actually the United States State Department during the Trump administration under the Uber Zionist Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The recognition is there. Only the commensurate action is missing. The recognition was also there during the Trump administration when it repeatedly acknowledged that Iran was in full compliance with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, also known as the Iran nuclear deal, yet Trump unilaterally withdrew from the landmark agreement. We saw similarly dissident behavior during the Bush and Obama administrations when not only all 16 US intelligence agencies, but also leading Israeli military and intel officials concurred that Iran was not building nuclear weapons but sanctioned Tehran with devastating effects on the Iranian people while incessantly threatening to wage a war against a country that hasn't started one since the Persian Empire invaded Afghanistan in 1856. I find it the height of ir irony that the U.S. imposes crippling economic sanctions on Iran for its non-existent nuclear weapons while pretending not to see that Israel is the only country in the Middle East that actually has them, and hundreds of them at that. But I do digress. You know, it's easy to take for granted that no matter what crimes Israel government and military may perpetrate against Palestine, 
and it's the only country on the planet which simultaneously perpetrates invasion, colonization, occupation, ethnic cleansing, apartheid, and oppression. No matter what, it can always count on billions of dollars in annual U.S. military aid. It can always count on diplomatic support, even when the members of the United Nations vote 160 to 2, or 160 to 3 because Palau or the Marshall Islands or so, such votes along with us to, convent, to condemn its crimes. But it doesn't have to be this way. It wasn't always this way. In fact, many of you may know that in 1956, when Britain and France and Israel conspired together on a premeditated invasion of Egypt in order to oust the Arab nationalist Gamal Abdel Nasser from power after he nationalized the Suez Canal, President Dwight Eisenhower threatened to withhold more than $100 million in U.S. aid if Israel didn't withdraw its troops from the occupied Sinai Peninsula. Within a month, they were all out. In the mid-1970s, when the former terrorist-turned-prime minister Yitzhak Rabin refused to cede strategic passes to the Sinai after Israel again occupied it during the Yom Kippur War, another terrorist, Henry Kissinger, U.S. Secretary of State, accused Rabin of being, quote, out of his mind, unquote, and President Gerald Ford sent Rabin a letter informing him that he was reassessing U.S. policy and held up the sale of F-15 fighters to Israel. A few short years later, under Jimmy Carter, Israel and Egypt had signed the historic Camp David Accords. After Israel's surprise attack on an Iraqi nuclear reactor in 1981, the Reagan administration worked with Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein to draft a Security Council resolution condemning the raid. And 10 years later, George H.W. Bush, citing a State Department legal opinion declaring Israel's settlements to be illegal, that stood from 1978 until Trump revoked it in 2019, but Bush delayed $10 billion in U.S. loan guarantees to Israel. Within a couple of years, Rabin would be signing the Oslo Accords with PLO leader Yasser Arafat. I'm not saying those things are exactly related, but my point is it's been done before. U.S. presidents have used either the threat of withholding aid or actual withholding to alter Israeli actions. It almost happened when Biden was vice president after Barack Obama called for a settlement freeze, but instead Netanyahu announced the approval of 1,600 new settler homes in the illegally occupied East Jerusalem at the same time Vice President Biden just happened to be visiting Israel. It was a big embarrassment. Um, but aside from a stern phone call from uh, Hillary Clinton and Obama showing up late for a dinner with Netanyahu, nothing came out of it. In fact, on his way out of the door in 2016, Obama vetoed a UN resolution condemning the settlements. And that's the way things are likely to go under a Biden administration. But they don't have to go that way, and they haven't always gone that way. If some of the most staunchly Zionist, conservative, warmongering presidents could dare pursue different policies and actions, Surely, with the right kind of pressure from the right kind of people, like us, maybe Biden could too. Thank you.